Welcome to another episode, a little catch-up, we don't want to call it an episode, boy. just a catch-up with me and Boydie, we've been going for 10 weeks now, um, just a little review, a little rundown, um, but right now, Boydie, we have been preparing for the Euros tomorrow night, um, do you think with your old manager and this group of players, Boydie, we could have got there? Yeah, I do, I think we did get through the Israel game, and then it was obviously going to be more of a dis- difficult task, um, Norway or Serbia, but... I do, I, I, I would have fancied us to get there, um, but I'm going to come back at you and ask you, had we, you know, had you to get the phone call, would you ever come out of retirement? That's an interesting one. Do you know what, boy, dear? I'd, I'd, I'd never say never for my country. Um, if Steve Clark, if he needed me, um, you know, he, he knows my number, he, he, knows, he knows where I am. Um, you know, it's, it's been a, interesting season for me ever since I stopped playing with Scotland I actually get in the I get in the side at West Ham scoring goals obviously creating goals and um, maybe f- between 15 and 20 games so listen um, I'd never I'd never say no to my country it's, uh, it's uh, obviously I've, I've been retired I've uh, enjoyed it at club level but I think boy you're right now you know, Sorry, just I'm, going to ask you, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you a question on that though see, see when you finish from international football because I've done it myself you went back and you're because you always say, right, I want to concentrate on my, my club level. Then you go back and, you know, your uh, your club level has, has been through the roof. You know, you've been scoring goals, assists, have been brilliant. Like, do you actually then think to yourself, you know what, I, can, I could go back now because I've found form at club level again? Yeah, you, you probably could say that, Boydie, but it was, um, when I went back in with Scotland, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't sort of lost form. It was just that, it was just at that time where, Pellegrini had signed. I played up 30, 35 games. I think it was the season before for him, and then he, you know, he signed um, some some high caliber uh, players and new signings. So for me, mate, it was just um, just had to be patient. So I thought, you know, I was playing at high level, and it was I wasn't really, um, you know, getting the minutes under my belt. Then I was going to be with Scotland, maybe you no know, feeling feeling great, and then I think you know Steve Clark had the, obviously decisions to make where it was. He had a, a cut of lads there that were playing games, and so I can I can totally understand um, that that situation. I, I just think right now we're looking at that current squad, boy. It's um, it's lacking, you know, a bit of leadership right now. Uh, young Robbo's find his trade as captain, but right now I don't think it's me. You probably um, need to be asking the question. I think Scott Brown should be coming out of retirement. Um, Scott Brown's a you know he's a elite level player when it comes to somebody for leadership you've seen him in you know Scotland dominating for years um he's a terrific guy um but when I played him with Scotland he was he's a winner and there's no doubt you've seen Selic go and dominate for you know a large part of his you know captaincy um and I think um you know Scotland needs Scotland needs somebody like Scott Brown. Um, you know, we'd, I'd love to see some, you know, somebody come right out of their shell and just, you know, take the lead for that centre midfield uh, role. Um, but when we're about the well, squad, we've seen, we, we seen it when he retired and Gordon brought him back. No, you did, but I just think when we're about the squad and, and Bryn we're about that year, he gave us such a lift, um, massive lift. Him, Scott Brown um, would be a. You know, it'd be exceptional to see him back. So it'll be a, a big one if we get um, Scott. Scott does. That's the only thing uh, missing for for, for Bruni's career. Your banner. Is, and your banner. Well, exactly. Obviously, mine. <laughs> he needs that. He needs that in his life. But no, I think it's only it's only that one thing he spoke about that he's you know he's missing is, is qualifying for a, a major tour. He's done everything else. So I would love to I would love to see Bruni back. So I know exactly what you're saying regarding uh, you know Scott Brown coming back with Scotland if that was a possibility. But what what's would would you still keep uh, Andy Robertson as a captain and, and what qualities has he got as a captain leader on the pitch as well? Oh, without, without a doubt, Robbo's Robbo's my captain. Um, he's he's took that took that role in his stride. He's um, he's got captain material all over him. Um, you know he was he was a very quiet lad when I'm. Um, met Robbo and then it took him about four days, <laughs> four days to commit to shell. And he's a, he's, a, he's a big character. He's a massive character. Um, he's he's got that winning at the top level. So he knows what it is to um, play at the top level. But you know, win things at the top level. So I think what I'm trying to say is having Bruni in there 
you know, helps. It just it helps the squad. Um, mm-hmm. He's such a he's such a big character. But the more people, that's why we speak about it in the in the podcast, boy, there about having a hub and a core of you know experience um, goes a long way. Helps a lot of young boys. Helps. Um, who would I like to see you? Um, Billy Gilmore's maybe coming into the squad. Young Greg Taylor's um, in the squad. Um, I think the the, the more I must ask, I must ask, how was the little mouse when he came into the squad, Greg Taylor? Because he, is, Taylor. Is, is he, he is the quietest little guy ever. Then you get to know him, and all of a sudden he's a wee chirpy, like <laughs> right in your face, annoying <laughs> the life out you. But, he's, oh, um, what was his nickname? The mouse. No, he he's. He's a brilliant lad. Um, it's just one lad that I just connected with straight away. Um, and, and most of the lads are like that, but for him, just being a young lad coming in, you know, I, I connected with him straight away. I always wanted him to sort of do well. And it's a tough one because he's got two very, obviously, um, top-class fullbacks in, in Robbo and KT, but fair play to him. He's in there. He's um, he's wanting to play. He's putting his cell in the, in the frame to play. Um, he's playing with a you know, top-class side in Celtic now. He's um, He's got that, you know, that title under his belt and he's, you know, he'll be flying high with confidence. But one thing I liked about him, his, his attitude was brilliant. Even when he wasn't playing, he was still in the gym doing all his bits and all that stuff, trying to be a, you know, a good sort of role model for, for the rest of the boys in the team. And that's all you asked when you were an international duty boy day. That's, I mean, 100%. You're, you're right. There's one thing that I always used to wind him up because his, his thighs were the size of my calves. He was like that. <laughs> he had nothing. There was more there was more, more meat in a butcher's pencil than the wee guy. But I mean, I totally, I totally agree with you um, in terms of training. Fantastic every single day at it. And and there's one thing with, with, with Greg Taylor, even in training, if he wasn't having a good session, his opponent wasn't having a good session because he was always in ratting about them and everything. And I think yeah. that the more of those guys you've got around the, the squad as well, um, the better. And, you know, yeah. you're right. I, you do feel a little bit sorry for him that, you know, the two guys ahead of him are, are um, yeah. at the level they're at. But that one... It just that pushes you even harder, though. Pushes him even harder. Expensive. He knows exactly what it's going to, what it's going to take to, to try and, you know, rub shoulders with these boys and put massive pressure on them. Because Robbo and KT, they'll definitely need that. Um, because when you, you certain times when you get away at a national duty boy day, and sometimes you're off form, and sometimes maybe at club level, so you know that hasn't really happened as such for the boys because you know they've been they've been doing well, and you know I know KT more so try to get back for his injuries, so I, I think it'll um, be all fun in games when the when the two of them are fit. Would you throw him in, Billy Gilman? I would, I would. He's 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 he's, he's no phase to be the playing at any level. He's got that. He's got that character about him. Um, he's like a Modric type player, isn't he? Where he, he just wants the ball at any, any area, and, and and I love that about a player. Um, and I think right now, when when you when you're trying to take the ball in tight areas, but you know Steve wants and every manager's kind of wanted. I definitely put him in. You, you, you know the balance is there. You've got you've got McGinn's, McGregor's, McTominay's, Christie's. You know, uh, very forward thinking players as well. Uh, you know. For someday just to kind of get the balance right, I've seen him with Chelsea in a short space of time. I think I think Billy Gilmore grand there would you know take it like a duck to water really to be honest with you, mate. So I think you've got to uh, you've got to look at the striking options and I think you know you, you need we speak about the balance and you speak about I think right now when we look at the the number nine options, McBurney, target man, Nazy, um, as he's getting a bit older, probably a target man who holds it up well, but he's free kick. Nazy, that's what that's what I love about Nazy. He's so clever. He's um he's very cute in certain areas. He needs he, he, Nazy needs pace for about him. Um, that's what that's no that's no question. So I think for me, I would always try and have like a where it was. If you've not got your pace for your wide areas, you need overlapping fullbacks. Um, so I think um Forrest um goes in there. He's he's flying high with you know, confidence. Ryan Fraser, um, we've seen a different Ryan Fraser this season where his assist took care of itself last season. But, you know, a lot of people don't realise Ryan, Ryan Fraser's been been playing, you know, with that you know, that panic button on. Am I going to get injured? Is it is it is it one of these situations where, you know, he's the, the club have actually played him more than I actually thought they were going to play him? I don't know if that's maybe because, because of he's got a to, contract. Yeah, because he's got a contract. So the Ryan Fraser, obviously we've seen the previous, a lot more confidence, um, you know, and I, I, I genuinely still believe this. I think we need to get our wingers and our forward-thinking players on the ball a lot higher up. Um, when I was in the squad, we were 
it was, it was kind of like, you know, he's trying to defend more because obviously the games I played was Belgium, Russia. Um, so how can we bring that into the game? Because we'll get some great forwards thinking players. And, and you've seen it. Um, we, we, we begin grabbing a hat trick and, and going and, and taking eight teams because we've definitely got the quality, boy. No, there's no, there's no doubt. I mean, I think we've got the quality. The, the number nine role for me is, is an interesting one. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think like a fit firing in all cylinders, Lee Griffiths is definitely someone who, you know, you'd want in about the squad and starting games and everything. But I just I just think the last couple of games when we we Nazi up top as well, you know, the link up play, John McGinn running beyond, um, that there seemed to be more a connection there. I mean, so I mean it's a great it's a great dilemma to have, you know, if you're the national manager, who do you start up front? But it'll be interesting, I think, with, with everybody fit that um, you know, who Steve Clark does um you know decide to play as that number nine role because there's no doubt that I mean, we, we speak about about important positions on the pitch. That is the most important position. You're only as good as your striker, Boy, the, strikers you, for me. Just where I've got you here, obviously you, you've been listen, your career speaks for itself. It's, it's you know the, your record it's, it's incredible. You're scoring goals. But what suited Chris Boyd better when he went away international? Was it was it playing me a striker? Was it playing me a number 10? Was it somebody that could stretch in behind for you to do your work into feet? What what, what do you think, you know, because I've seen us at like Scotland level and we failed with one striker. We've not qualified. So do we do we go out and out? Because the best partnership I, I, I got playing at a number 10 was with Stephen Smith. Me and Nezzy, um and we, He's a clever we, player. The, the game against Croatia um, at home, it was, it was you know, he scored, I scored, um, and I think they had Lover and they had all the top boys playing at top level. And we we comfortably um, beat Croatia that night. And that's when I thought really then we, we are really going to kick on. So just where I've got you here, what did you prefer? Two strikers or a number 10? Or, or up there on your own, what did you prefer? Well, to be honest, I preferred playing against a team that was ranked, um, you know, below 50 in the world because you always get chances. The rest, you get nothing. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I always preferred to... to um, I always prefer to, to play with a partner. Um, I, under, I understand that it's not until you finish when you look back or the older you get, you realise that um, you know in all games it's it's not possible um, because you, you didn't want to, to to leave. You know your midfield is such maybe three v two against better opposition. You wanted to have the, the exact same numbers in there. But <clears throat> I mean, I always prepared. To, uh, I was always um, for me two, two strikers. You know, I think the, the easiest way to sum it up is if you're going to dig a hole. You want to dig it yourself, or do you want to, or do you yeah, want yeah. help to dig that? Especially, hole? especially playing against the you know higher up uh, opposition, boy. They, there's so many times um, where you know teams know if you're playing up top, they disrespect. It was the same as me. We didn't have you know blistering pace or pace. We could use our mind in different areas, but you know defenses they get up high, didn't they? They think to themselves, you know, I can push him up, and it, there's there's that's fine. I'm fine here. He's not going to cause any problems in behind. But if you're playing with somebody, even. I always touch on it where it's he it doesn't need to have blistering pace. I know people say about stretching teams, but have somebody in the number ten to drag in. You, the defenders don't want to get into the number ten position, never. So it's you no playing up against somebody, boy. It's a number ten, obviously creating space for you to say, well, do you know what? Yeah. You go in the wee pockets where fullbacks, centre half, they don't want to get in there. Defensive midfielder who picks him up. That's a that's the clever number ten. That's I always try to build a a relationship with Nazi. Say Nazi, do you know what? Just stay on the last man. So many times I would get and pick wee pockets. I did it at Hull in a number 10 position. And it was, it was because I knew myself, I'm never going to run in behind. But threaten and come in, get get the ball on your feet. Then you've got options. Play with, you, obviously, you've got your wingers, you've got overlapping fullbacks. That's what really excited me was playing a number 10, having options run about the ball. And I remember a training session, boy, day, honestly, God, I remember it as if it was yesterday, Gordon Stratton. We trained doing it at Capolo. And it was, it was one day, you know, Gordon Stratton's, Stop to session. It was belting down by rain, right? Stop to session. We, I think the game's about eight seven, right? And I'm no joke. He's on top. No, it was unbelievable, and it was just pure attacking football. It was so flowing for both sides. And he went, lads, I'll tell you what, we could have come down here. We just played the USA. I think it was on a Friday night. We could have come down here. We, we could have just, you know, it's easy, Ozzy. It was on. I think it was on a Sunday or something like that. But it was belting down by rain. And the standard was unbelievable. And that's when I thought, really, at that point, we have got the players, we've got the manager, everything set up for us to you know, really have a go at teams. And we were, he was always trying to work on uh, new things, um, playing with Scotland, <clears throat> always trying to get 
you know, how can we get that little 1% more and we can do so? How can we excite teams? And we did. We did. We were on a great run where we were, you know, beating teams who were un, undefeated. And that, that was, um, I think I was right before I, I'd done my eight. I, I loved um, under other under that rain. It was, it was brilliant. He just spent stop session, let's go, because that's enough. That was amazing. That's so I, I that's think one thing I remember we got Always we got, we got. I remember when we we were on the pro license and we came down to watch use training kind of type thing. And Charlie was there, <clears throat> Charlie Adam, and um, I'll never forget it. It was brilliant for Gordon in terms of like digging people out and everything. He didn't need to do it because it was like Charlie tried that big, you know, that four hundred and forty yard diagonal. He always tries yeah. every every match, every ten <laughs> minutes. So he got the ball and boom, straight to the pitch. He gets on it. You know, a couple of minutes later. Tries it again, boom. And I say to me, God, me Gordon's looking, he says, Charlie, is there something up with the balls today? And Charlie, I'm totally oblivious to it. Then the next time he gets on the ball, tries it again, bang, straight to the pitch. And uh, we Gordon turns to me and says, you must not like the balls today, Charlie. You don't like the balls. <laughs> <laughs> you keep kicking them away. He <laughs> loves but, it. But it was, it, was, it was, the banter was brilliant. And that was one thing that... Um, you know, when I, I came down to do a couple of things for for, uh, for Sky Sports as well, um, you know, running about the camp at that time and, and coming down with the pro licence and stuff like that as well, that there always seemed to be, you know, a good camaraderie with, with the boys, um, you know, and yeah. I think you go back to that 2000 and, um, well, it was what, three three years um, on Wednesday, three years yesterday, that, um, yeah. you know, that England game, but that campaign... <sighs> That was the one where you think, where you thought to yourself, well, if that could have been that, it was the exact same as for the qualifying yeah. for the, the 2008 Euros, where we felt as if, you know, that was our chance. Did you yeah. feel the same? I did, mate. I, I genuinely felt at that point um, that we, you know, we, we, we did have a great chance um, and, and we were, you know, we were winning games and it was, it was very, you know, it was frustrating that England one. Um, would would have been the you know would have been nice and on the cake really the the for my Scotland career anyway in terms of you know beating them and um the way we'd have done it um it was a sickening blow obviously you know the way we they conceded in the last uh, minute we had a chance I think it was I know, it was sure Armstrong we had a chance to you know pass it or whatever keep going with it. um and you know Griffiths produces that's, two that's of the, the best. difference so they see at that level oh, they, see, like, that, they, they, they wee mistakes you know that pass because it was actually you could have played it one side and you're in. And if you went the other yep. side, you were three and straight through, probably three one to yep. Scotland, game over, maybe, you know, playoffs yep. for, for 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 the for the for the World Cup. But you know, they're the wee the wee things that you always you always look back and say to yourself, you know what, that just went against us. That's not it's right. And then how do you um so for, for me as I've always thought about it, so it's always when I've been in the squad boy days, how you how do you get the lads to think it's those small things that actually matter? Do you know what I mean? Like to try and say it might be that that, that then is a the difference for us qualifying or no? So when I was running about the squad towards then, it was it was more trying to you know convince the lads that you know you are, you are very good players, but we must believe in ourselves as a team because that's one thing I touch on there about um, you know you speak about number nines and you know I don't think we've seen the best of Ollie Burnley. All of McBurnley I've seen at Sheffield United, boy they um, had a great game against us. Like target man putting his sail about. I think you, you know, all the McBurnley needs a needs a goal. Needs needs you know needs that yeah, those goals at the back of the net when he turns up and plays with Scotland. He needs to be the main man. But that's the problem. You've got everybody wants to be that number nine and be the top striker. I just think that we, we need to you know we need to figure out a a formation and a and a partnership that that suits everybody and suits the team. Um, and you could get right through the, the squad, even the midfield area, full backs and, and stuff. But we'll leave that for we'll leave that for another. Leave that for that. So you, what you mentioned there as well. You could chuck wee John Flake into that centre mid as well. I totally forgot about him because he's another terrific player who's now for full uh, potential as well. But <clears throat> see when you say about those small things, try to convince people and everything. I'll never forget that, that um, with Michael O'Neill um, come over and um, gave us all a talk and. It was the exact same thing when, when he went into Northern Ireland. They hadn't won an international game in so many games. They had, I mean, he, I think his first 10 or 11 games, he hadn't won either. And um, it, it was players were used to, to losing. But what he, I think he was able to look at the, the table from the qualifying campaigns, strip it back and say, look, this is our table after 60 minutes in a game. And it was like they were joint, they were joint top. Yeah. 
um, or yep. in the playoff position. So trying to spin a positive intake to say, listen, there's only 30 minutes left in this game. We can go and get a result. You know, and, yep. and I think that because it was players, and you know what it's like your mindset when you've been on a, on a you know, winning's a habit, but so is losing. And when you're playing yep. games of football, and um, you know, if you're able to look at it and say, you know, those last 30 minutes. At the start of his uh, reign as, as, as Northern, Ireland, Northern Ireland manager, they were probably saying, we're going to lose a goal here. There was players yeah. that hadn't won an international match in like two years and stuff like that. It was unbelievable. But, you know, trying to convince and change the mentality to all of a sudden, you know, we can win a game. And then you can you can start to build things. You can start to go from there. And, and um, I mean, when you, when, you look at, when you look at what, um, you, know, it, you know, and Michael O'Neill and, and, and Northern Ireland have achieved, You've got to then ask yourself the question of, of why we've never, um, of why we've not been a, a major competition, um, you know, since 1998. Oh, but... oh, here's, here's one for you. Uh, um, if we would have played it right now, and it would have went ahead the Euros without any fans, how how big would the Tartan Army have been for us? You know, if we'd have, would they have missed them, you know, because the Tartan Army, for me, some of the best fans in the world. Um, 100%. You know yourself. I, I used to love it when it used to ho- home and away. They're all the time incredible. I just, you know, I, I felt for me, I'd feel as if that would have been a big factor for us knowing that we didn't have, you know, them uh, behind us if we'd have went, you know, with no fans. So, um, for me, I, I think personally, um, it was it was a right it was a right decision because they, they would have been massive for us, um, in the upcoming fixtures. No, hundred percent. But listen, that will do us. That's enough of a Scotland chat. So we'll move on to something else. But. Um, Hopefully, hopefully, if we get there, we might, we might Fingers see, crossed. Fingers crossed. we might see Snodcast returning a Scotland jersey. You just <laughs> never know. You never know. Well, Snoddy, with the Euro starting, who would be your favourite? I'm going to see Belgium. Um, playing against them, seeing De Bruyne um, at the level he's at right now. Like Kaku's on fire in Italy. Um, for Inter Milan, he's um, he's one that. For me, uh, he could, you know, could set the the Euros alight. He's um, he's an incredible talent, and uh, I think you know he likes a Hazard uh, playing, uh, getting back as well now and back back fit and playing. So I think they've got some some great talent. They play the right way. They get top um, uh, manager and Martinez. So I'm going to go for Belgium. Yeah. How about yourself? Well, I think you would obviously be the favourites along with, with France, but I, I can't. The, the talented players that England's got, and with Harry Kane up front, anything could happen. Um, you know, I know that, that, that there's there's there, there is a a very very talented group. Um, you know, within the, the England setup, some excellent players, and um, the winner would come from one of those three. But if I have to pick one, I'm going for Belgium as well, mate. If we were going to see England there, yeah. we, we can't, we can't separate us. Imagine, by the way, <laughs> yeah, ima- imagine you having to get any training with, with, if England had won the Euros. No, no, no. Listen, the um, the, the, the football chat needs to stop before I forget. It's um, it's the, the 10k in June challenge <laughs> for Chris Boyd. <laughs> you, you have been avoiding my messages about this, you avoided the wanky, but we're only the 10k. Talk me through. Have you been training? Have I been training? I've never done a run since I finished. I've been on my bike. <laughs> Are you going to do it, boy? I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it, and, I, and I'm. You can make a decision for me here, right? I, w- I was. Did I do the 10k or did I set up a half marathon? <laughs> There we go. See, there you go. There's, 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 there's me. But I'm thinking, what I'm, because I know, I'm telling you, I don't care how long it takes me. I don't, I don't care how long it takes me. Even if I need to walk a little bit and I'm going to get my missus to take me as far away from the house as, what is it, 13 miles or something. Survival mode will kick in. I'll get myself home. I'm going to open up a Just Given account. Half the, half the funds will go to the Darby Rimmer um, Foundation and half the funds are going to go to, to my own charity as well. So, there's well, the yeah, plan. I love, and it, I love your idea. I love your enthusiasm. And the fact is, you've got your charities ready. I love that. That's what I love about I've you. Th- I've been that thinking about it. But listen, what you just said the other night about you can walk a bit, you can jog a bit. That's exactly... That's what I wanted you to be thank you. <laughs> I didn't want you to run it. I, don't, I know you've been drinking... I'm going to raise awareness... But- I'm going to raise no. a for MMD and um, and mental health, and we'll all, if, I, if it takes me, if it takes that's, me ten hours, it, I'm doing it, mate. I'm that's doing it. 
They see this attitude, I'd have played you up in that number nine yourself. I tell you that right. I'll tell you what to do though, mate. And I'm not joking you. Could you send me your legs up just for just for just for a few hours? <laughs> but um no, stay tuned. Um we'll get we'll get the just given page set up, we'll get it out there. Um and we'll get going for there. And I'm definitely gonna do it before June. We'll get the day, all the details details will be there. And um, I look forward to doing it. And as I said, I don't care how long it takes. Raise awareness for MMD and um, mental health. So it's all for a good cause. So everybody, stay tuned. We'll get going for there. But it's been fa fantastic catching up with Snoddy on the Scotland stuff. And, oh, yeah. and then obviously him digging me out again about this 10K. But it's changed now, my man. It's changed. I'm fitter. I'm ready to go. But, but um, I thrive under pressure, mate. I thrive under pressure. But listen, everybody, take care. Stay safe. And um, we'll catch you all soon. <laughs>